the sky, let it rise, let it rise from the dark into light. Now alive, now alive, but we are here to lift you up, here to sing a song of love, here to give you God what you are worth.
It's, uh, it's so good to be here. Uh, I am excited to be here. Uh, I'm excited to be where we are in the Gospel of John. Uh, we just wrapped up the first 12 chapters, uh, and now we're stepping into chapter 13. We started it last week with a new focus. Jesus just spent 12 chapters revealing to us who he is. And now as we step into chapter 13, he starts a new kind of series with us, a new message. It's not just who he is, but who we are to become. And I love this. How many, how many history buffs do we have out here? Anyone that loves history? Okay, so only a few people that are kind of, you know, special in the head, right? Okay. I love history. Okay, most people don't. Wednesday nights is history night at my house. Uh, my older kids go to youth group. Uh, my younger, my daughter, uh, stays home with me, and we study history. Her history tests are on Thursday. So every Wednesday night, we get to study history, which I love, she hates. She doesn't like history. She thinks it's boring. And I, I love trying to kind of bring it to life and bring significance to like understanding who these people are, like what happened with these events. Why is it significant that we know and remember these things? Like I, I absolutely love it. Um, we're, we're studying different leaders right now. How many people can look back over the course of history and one to two leaders, either in our nation's history or just world history, one to two leaders stand out as being somewhat inspirational for you? Anyone? Yep. Okay. So throw some names. Who's, who is an inspirational leader? Man, Abraham Lincoln. That was the first one from this morning too, man. Like one of the most epic beards of our nation's history, right? That man knew what was up. I love Abraham Lincoln. Okay. Someone else. Okay. I heard Martin. I think that was Martin Luther King. Okay, Martin Luther, the reformer, and Martin Luther King, both of them instrumental, very significant, love those people. So I, I don't know who rises to the top that, that you think of when we speak of inspirational leaders, but here's the question. When you think about any of those, and thank you for not just giving the church answer, Jesus, right? Like, thank you. But how many of you, when you thought of that leader, the next thing that came to mind was, man, I'm on my way. I'm going to be just like fill in the blank. I'm going to be just like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. I'm going to be just like Martin Luther, the reformer, or Martin Luther King. How many of you thought, actually had that thought? I am going to be just like that. Probably not, because we revere those people, and they may inspire us and help us shape our lives in some way, but... Those leaders are on a different level, right? Like when we think about them, there's no way that we could live that kind of a life. That that's where today's message, this, that's where what Jesus is sharing with us is so radically different. Jesus is not just saying, I am some leader that is set apart, that is set beyond. He's looking us and he's saying, I am the leader. I am the person that you are to become. I have lived a life. I have set an example that you not only should follow, but that you can follow. What is so significant about John chapter 13 is that he shares with us the foundation of our sanctification. We talked about sanctification last week, what it means to be a mature Christian or to mature in our faith, to be able to look to Jesus, to follow Jesus, and to ask the Spirit to do a work inside of us so that our character and our priorities start to look like Jesus's character and priorities. Well, today, Jesus starts that conversation with us, and today we are going to look at the foundation, what it means to have the mind of Christ. What is it to have the mind of Christ? And next week, we're going to look at the heart of Christ. And then we're, the following week, we're going to look at the life of Christ. And we're going to be reading these things and looking at these things, and, and the goal is for us to see that we have an inside view into this very intimate conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. 
chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, Jesus is sitting at the table with his disciples. He spent 12 chapters revealing who I am, and now he's sitting with them, and he is saying, you are to become who I am. So open up to John chapter 13. This is a chapter that has been studied by so many people. There's a gentleman uh, that was alive uh, in America in the 60s. He had actually worked for AT&T for 40 years. Has anyone else ever held a job for 40 years? No. Okay. Yeah, a couple. Okay. Congratulations. That is amazing. Uh, thinking about this this morning, I just read a news headline about a gentleman in Sao Paulo, Brazil, who's been at the same job for 81 years. He turned 101 years old this year, and he's been at the same job for 81 years. Unbelievable. So, so this gentleman, Robert Greenleaf, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, Towards the end of the 60s, he was wrapping up 40 years working for AT&T as their management specialist. It was his job to study managerial skills, to teach managerial skills, and to help the people inside of AT&T become the best leaders that they could be. So for 40 years, that was his bread and butter. That was his job. He's going to learn leadership. He's going to teach leadership. And then in 1969, he retired from 40 years of working in AT&T, and he turned that same attention to John chapter 13. For 40 years, he learned how to study leadership. And now he started asking the question, what does it mean to lead like Jesus. And in 1970, he wrote a paper called The Servant Leadership of Christ. He was one who coined the phrase servant leadership. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Sir, someone has, okay. <laughs> servant leadership. What does it mean to be a servant leader? And then he wrote several books and other articles on servant leadership. And he, he set up in a seminary an institute of applied moral ethics and for the remainder of his life, he spent his time trying to pass on the leadership skills of Jesus that were rooted in what he found in John chapter 13. So open up your Bibles. We want to encourage you to, to have your Bibles on your lap, touch them, hold them, read them, see it with your eyes. We want you to encounter the Word of God and allow it to change you. If you need a Bible, we have some in the back, but we encourage you, bring it with you and interact with your Bible. Take notes uh, because Jesus has something to say here. So John chapter 13, let's, let's jump into this and see what Jesus has for us. It says, now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were with him in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. Now, we went through all of that last week, right? You want me to preach it again? No, okay, you, you got it, right? These four verses, th this incredible build up, like John is setting the stage, he's, he's changing the focus from the first 12 chapters where Jesus is revealing who he is to chapter 13 when we are transported to sit at the table with Jesus, can we just take a moment and appreciate the word of God? Can we appreciate the fact that what we are about to read are the words and actions that Jesus did at the last encounter that he had with his disciples? And we get to be there. We get to sit at the table with Jesus. We get to experience this through the word of God. And we get to hear Jesus' heart, not just for the disciples, but for us. So feel the pressure, feel the buildup here, because John is unpacking this and he is saying, this is it. This is the final note. This is the last thing that Jesus is going to say and do with us. All authority, everything is resting on him. This is the final words that he's gonna give us. This pressure is building up. And then Jesus rose from supper and it says he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. I need a bigger towel. This one's not gonna fit around, so I'll just 
stick it in my pocket, okay? Jesus rose from the supper table. He took off his outer garment. He took off his clothes. Now look at the identity shift that's happening right here. Jesus, their master, their teacher, the Messiah, all powerful, the words of John, in the beginning was, you guys are asleep, let's, let's try that again. In the beginning was the, right, in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was Jesus, the creator, the author of everything. Jesus who spoke everything into being and holds all things together. Jesus, the Messiah, the creator, is now taking off that identity, setting it aside, and he is taking on the identity of a servant. Can you let that sit in? If you are sitting at the table and you are watching Jesus stand up, and you're watching your Messiah take off his clothes and pick up the towel, what goes through your mind? The first thing that I want to see here, the first thing that I want to point out here is that this is not about an event. This is not about the event of the foot washing of the disciples. If it was, then, then we would be teaching on this and we'd have water basins at the front and we would be going through our weekly wit, uh, foot washing service. And then next week, we would have about half the number of people here. Because if you knew that was gonna happen every Sunday, how many people would just check out that is not the church for me, right? Okay, well, listen, this is not about the event of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. It's about the life of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. This isn't something that Jesus was doing. This is who Jesus was at the core. What defined all of Jesus' life was his willingness to grab a towel. This is the identity of Jesus, our servant king. His identity rooted in the fact that everything about him, not just this one event, but every day that he woke up from the moment he was born was the day that Jesus grabbed the servant's towel. Can you hear that? Can you see that? Can you feel that? When we see what Jesus is doing here, he's, he's defining for his disciples. He wants them to finally see the fullness of who he is and what it means for him to inhabit this identity. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to become like Jesus? It starts with having the mind of Jesus, the image of Jesus set in us. Do we have this mindset in us? Jesus started the sanctification conversation with taking on the nature of a servant. And the disciples didn't understand it right now, but John would record these words and the disciples would come back and, 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 and kind of dissect this encounter and understand this encounter later. But this became the cornerstone. This became disciple making 101. When Jesus told his disciples in just a few days, when he would look at them after he had rose from the dead and he would tell them, go and make disciples in all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded him. What was Jesus talking about? What did Jesus command his disciples? What did Jesus tell his disciples to do? The last conversation Jesus had was this conversation. So when Jesus said, go and make disciples, go and make followers of me, go and make people into my likeness, where did it start? It started with grabbing a towel. It started with teaching people, this is what it means to follow Jesus, to take on his servant nature. Later, Paul would write 
in Philippians. And I want to encourage you to flip over to Philippians chapter 2. Keep in mind what we just read, that Jesus taking off his outer garments and putting on the towel, putting on the nature of a servant. Listen to this. And we're going to see how awake you are, okay? Because here, Paul starts setting the bar low. Amen? We need, we need more churches like that, right? Like he starts setting the bar low. Listen to what, what Paul says. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... Do you have any encouragement at all? Like even just a little bit. Okay, someone did. Okay, all right, all right. Thank you, Tim. All right. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, anybody have any, just a little comfort from his love? Okay, well, I'm a little more excited about it than that, but um, what about this? If any common sharing in the spirit, thank you, Jesus, for giving us the Holy Spirit. How many of you have the Holy Spirit in your life? All right, there we go. There we go. All right. See, thank you, Paul. You set the bar low, but this is good stuff. I've been encouraged by Jesus. I've, I've had comfort from his love, from his, from his spirit. It, then he says, if you have any tenderness or compassion at all, anybody? I know these may not be the things that you want, like as a man, like, yeah, I am a tender, compassionate man. Maybe on a dating profile, right? But outside of that, like, yeah, that's not exactly the way you'd want to describe yourself, right? But Paul was saying, if you have any tenderness or compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, having one mind. Listen to this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but instead to the interest of others. Paul was saying, discipleship, becoming like Christ, sanctification starts right here. If you have any comfort, if you've even barely started your spiritual journey, it starts right here. Take off yourself. Set your priorities to the side. Think of others as being more important than yourself. Listen to how he goes on to describe it, this next sentence. It says, in your relationship with one another, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Could not be more clear than that. And then if, if you have your Bibles open right now, look at it. The paragraph style changes. How many in your Bible, the paragraph style, say it, the font is a little different. It goes from like, it, it looks like a poem. What we're about to read actually is a poem. It's something that was not written by Paul. It was something that was given to Paul. It's something that Paul probably learned in the first 14 years of his spiritual sanctification. Where maybe one of the disciples sang him this song and said, hey, I want you to memorize this song. I want you to internalize this song because this song is about the mind of Christ. And I believe that this song that we are about to read was written out of the experience of John chapter 13. So as the disciples would get on their donkeys or their camels and they would turn on Christian hit top 40 on their radios, Okay, this is the song that came on. This was what, what Phil Wickham and, and, and all of them, this is what they wrote in the first century, okay? Listen to this. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. This is to be, this is, come to be known as the kenosis, the emptying of Jesus. Remember that word, kenosis. In some translations, I believe the NIV, it says that he emptied himself out. He made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, is at this moment where it would be really easy to read that and just kind of shake your head and say, not my Jesus. My Jesus is king. My Jesus is powerful. My Jesus is the creator of all things. He sits on high. I would not use words like humble to describe my powerful Jesus, but that is who Jesus was. 
This is the nature, this is the core part of who Jesus was, that he took on the image of a servant. You see what Paul is describing here, and you can almost visualize Jesus taking off his clothes, stepping out of heaven, and taking on the very form of a man, the nature of a servant. Jesus, the creator of the world, now bottled up in a manger in the body of an infant that didn't even have enough arm control to suck his own thumb. Can you see that? Jesus, fully God, yet fully man, in the form of an infant, growing as a toddler, Jesus learning to take his first steps, Jesus learning to say his first words. Does that sound humbling? God on high, Jesus learning how to speak, and then Jesus growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus had to grow in wisdom. You ever think about that humility? That's why I'm saying this is not about a foot-washing event. This is about a lifestyle that Jesus embraced. He embraced the identity of a humble servant, in Mark and in Luke, it's Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's talking about servant leadership and he, he looks at them and he says, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. This is the lifestyle of Jesus. He humbled himself. He, take, he took on the form of a servant. Think about it. Every day that Jesus woke up, he woke up, grabbed the rag, grabbed the towel, and said, I know who I am, and I know what I've come to do. I have come to serve and to save. To save through my servantship. And Paul was singing this in this, in this hymn. He said, in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The greatness of Jesus is the result of his humility. The power of Jesus, the, the life transformational work of Jesus is rooted in his identity of service. That is his identity. So when you think about that, what does that have to do with you? Taking on the nature of a servant sets the stage for sanctification. Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want to grow in your spiritual maturity? Do you want to look at your life one day? Do you want others to look at you and see Jesus in you? It starts with this mindset. Do you have the mind of a servant? Think about what that would actually do to you. Listen to this quote. This is a quote from Trinity Western University. They believe in servant leadership. They hold their staff to the uh, servant leadership model. And listen to this paragraph talking about servant leadership. It frequently requires giving up one's rights and desires in order to serve God and others before and over self. They are committed to serving others with integrity, with humility, with sincere concern, a generous, forgiving, and giving heart and self-discipline. They relate to others by investing, empowering, caring for, and consulting others. They are willing to sacrifice personally for the well-being of others. Does that sound like it's describing Jesus? Does that sound like it's describing you? When you ask someone, like, what, what do you think of me, or what comes to mind when you hear my name, are, is, are these the character traits, are these the priorities that someone would list when they are describing who you are? Any of you grow up with sports heroes? You can collect sports memorabilia, some, some people, okay? When I was much younger in the 80s, like I loved the Atlanta Braves. <laughs> wow, that's an interesting choice, Pastor Michael, the Braves. Of 
Okay, first service, it was kind of the same thing. They were just like, Atlanta, who? We don't care about the Braves at all. Okay, so when, when I was younger, in the 80s, when the Braves were probably at their worst, one of, their, one of, one of my favorite baseball players was Dale Murphy. Again, yeah, <laughs> I give up, right? Nobody knows who Dale Murphy is, right? Well, he was a childhood hero of mine, okay? When the Braves were awful, I watched them on TV, and I watched Dale Murphy, I watched him bat, I watched him hit, I watched him catch, I watched him throw, like I I studied what he did. And I remember going to my first Atlanta Braves game, it was the Braves versus the Cardinals, and the Braves got demolished. Praise God, it was awesome. We lost all the games in the 80s, so it it didn't didn't break my heart. I was just glad I was there because I could see Dale Murphy in person. And I remember wanting the baseball. I wanted the baseball to be just chipped out of bounds and just land in my lap and be the one that got it to bring it home because I wanted that memorabilia to go home so that I could continue to study and be inspired by the great Dale Murphy. Right? Later that year, I would take my t-ball team to greatness because of studying Dale Murphy. Okay, I peaked with t-ball and it was just downhill after that. But I remember like wanting that ball and I wanted that because I wanted to be like Dale Murphy. That ball said everything about who he was and who I wanted to be. This, this is our sports memorabilia for Jesus Christ. When we hold this in our hands, when we look to this, this, this towel, this says everything about the identity of who Jesus is and who we are to become. And it sounds like that's, that's soft, like we're, we're just being made to be a pushover. And then, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's the kind of leader I want to be, but if you study Jesus, if you keep studying him, we're going to keep reading, we're going to find that that doesn't mean you're a pushover. It doesn't mean that you're soft in that way. It just means that this is the core character trait of your life. Is it yours? Listen to what we find next. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now the disciples are like, whoa, I thought Jesus was just doing like a super weird, crazy, cheesy illustration. He's actually doing this. Jesus is actually getting down on his knees and and he's playing with our toes. He's washing the dirt off of our feet. He's getting in between in the little awkward toe web. Like, my Jesus doesn't belong there. Think about that. How much confidence does it take for a leader that has been seen as the Messiah, as the creator of the world? How much confidence does it take to get down on his knees and say, I'm not insecure at all? Nothing is beneath me. I know who I am. I know what I'm called to do. I will do even this. And he gets down and he starts washing the disciples' feet. I just found this in the janitor closet and there's a bunch of different colors and I wondered if they were kind of color-coded for a specific reason. Turns out blue is for toilets. So (laughs) don't shake my hands afterwards. I chose wisely. But that captures exactly what it was that Jesus was doing. He was doing the lowest possible thing that someone in his culture could do. But he was secure. He was bold. He was clear. Listen to this encounter. Like Jesus didn't miss a beat. He went around and started washing the disciples' feet. He maybe started with John and then his brother James and then Bartholomew, the disciple that no one ever remembers. He starts going around, starts washing their feet, and then he comes to Peter. Listen to this. He came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? You can just see Peter watching Jesus as he gets closer and just he's shaking his head. Not my Jesus. You're not touching these feet. So he comes to him, he says, Lord, you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand right now, but afterwards you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus. Peter pushes back, pushes against, tells Jesus, you are wrong. You are not doing what you are supposed to do. How did Jesus respond to that? Jesus answered super skillfully and super confidently, very clearly. He says, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. 
And Simon Peter said, all right, I'm all in. Lord, not just my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you is. Let's not focus too much on on Peter or uh, on Judas and what this says about Judas. I, I just want to look clearly at what Jesus is doing right here. Jesus wasn't a pushover. Jesus wasn't some, some soft, soft-spoken man. He knew how to turn it up. He knew how to buck up. He knew how to stand against the authorities. He knew how to be everything that he was because he knew who he was. He knew what he was called to. He knew what his mission was. So he had a bold confidence about him that was tangible I don't know how many of you watch The Chosen. I, I encourage you guys to, to watch that. It's actually really impressive the way they've pulled that together. But they capture this part of Jesus' personality really, really well. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and sharing with Nicodemus who he is and why he came, there's a time where Nicodemus looks at him and says, Jesus, people are going to have issues with what you're saying. You can't say that. So Jesus being the, you know, pushover, servant leaders. Oh, you're right, Nicodemus. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend anyone. That's not what Jesus says. You read in John chapter three, Jesus looked at Nicodemus and pretty much says, yeah, I would expect people to have a problem with me. I'm going to say some very offensive things. He didn't shrink back. He was bold. He was clear. When he's talking to the disciples in John chapter four and said, hey, we got to go through Samaria. And the disciples are like, Jesus, you're an idiot. We don't go through Samaria. That's, that's not the place where Jews go. Jesus was like, no, nah, we're going. And later with Pilate, taking up these offenses from the, the, the high priest Caiaphas and, and saying, Jesus, look, we're going to have you crucified. I have the power to take your life, Jesus. Was Jesus intimidated at all? He just looks at Pilate. Cool story, bro. I'm glad you feel that. I lay my own life down. No one takes it from me. Jesus had this crazy, bold confidence that was unshakable because he knew who he was and he knew why he was called. He knew who he was. He knew his purpose. He knew he was a servant leader to the very end. He had this bold confidence, which was very different than the insecure immaturity of the leaders around him, and oftentimes of the disciples. Now, think about that. Think about that, that, that juxtaposition of people looking at Jesus. Now, let's look at the disciples. What came out of them when they were insecure? What came out of them when they were squeezed? Here in, in, in Mark chapter 10, it's right after the rich young ruler was, was being interviewed to be one of the next disciples, which I'm sure shook all of the other disciples. They were probably terrified that this rich young ruler was going to come take their place. Can you imagine having that person working the cubicle next to you? You're tanked, right? Your reputation is over. Everyone's going to look to this next great leader that's sitting right beside you. But the rich young ruler didn't make the cut, which did what to the disciples' egos? <laughs> right? They got big heads. Like, wait, he didn't make the cut, but I did. And then what did James and John do? James and John started jockeying for position. They came up and had this private conversation with Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, could you do us a solid? When we get to heaven, let me and my brother sit next to you, sit on your right hand. Just kind of make us kings over all of Israel. Can you do that small little favor for us? Can you imagine that? Why do people jockey for position? Because they're not secure in their position. Listen to how that plays out. When, when the others heard about this, when the 10 other disciples heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. It's a nice way of saying the disciples wanted to rally up and crush their faces. So then Jesus, said, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. 
And Jesus starts pointing out like another leader characteristic that is common in the world. And you think about the leaders that Jesus was speaking about, whether it was Herod or Caesar or Nero. What defined these leaders was their gross insecurity. Nero was so scared that his reign was going to be taken away that he killed his mom, his wife, and his brother-in-law. He was so insecure, he was so threatened that he lashed out at them, killed them so that he could fight for and secure his leadership role. Does that sound like anyone in our culture? Does that sound like any of our social media feeds? Never mind, okay, I won't say that. Um, Jesus starts pointing this out. Jesus starts looking at the disciples and, and says, you're, you're just as insecure and immature as the leaders of this world. Can't you just rest in my love for you? Can't you just rest in my boldness and my clarity? Can't you find yourself in me? Jesus challenges them on that and calls them out of insecurity, calls them out of immaturity, and calls in them into clarity and confidence. Saying, if you can step into this trait, if you can get down, if you can humble yourself, if you can engage in that kind of service mentality, it will transform your identity. And in confidence, if you can serve one another in love, it will change you to your core. And you will find a confidence. You will find a boldness in me. And you will begin to look around and you will care less about the attitudes and opinions of this world. Do you need that? Then grab your towel. Look at what Jesus does when he's going around and he's washing his disciples' feet, think about this. The boldness, the clarity of who he was, he was clear enough to wash the disciples' feet. He was clear enough to get down and engage in this act of humiliation. It didn't bother him a bit because he was clear on who he was and what he was called to do. When he encountered resistance, when someone he loved and respected looked at him and said, you're wrong, he was confident enough to wash Peter's feet and say, buddy, you'll, you'll get it eventually. You're not gonna shake my identity. You're not gonna shake my emotions. You're not gonna shake my calling because I know who I am. Jesus, in his servant mentality, in his servant identity, was confident enough to wash Peter's feet and get this. He was mature enough to wash Judas's feet. What would you have done when you got around 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6? You're taking your way down to Judas. You get to Judas. You get down on your knees before the man that is going to roll on you, the man that is going to throw your life under the bus, literally. And then you get down on your knees to serve Judas. If you're anything like me, like you've you got the towel in hand and you kind of put it in your back pocket and you pull out the sandpaper and you're like, all right, Jesus, let's go to town, buddy. Your toes are going to be bleeding when I'm done with you, right? But Jesus got down and in humility, in love, in boldness, in the security of who he was, he didn't lash out at Judas. He didn't have this immature rant that he posted just to fight back against this person who just is completely against every value of Christianity, he didn't have to do that because he was secure in who he was and he loved Judas to the end, even though Judas was wrong. This is a barometer for sanctification. <laughs> when you know you are resting in the identity of Jesus to the point that you can wash your Judas's feet, you know that Jesus is becoming alive in your life. Hold on to that. Keep on to that. Are you growing in your Christ-likeness? And then Jesus turns the corner and kind of wraps things up. He, he brings this illustration to a close. Starting in verse 12, he says this. He says, when he had washed their feet, he put on his outer garments and resumed his place. Can you feel that? 
The disciples saw him take his clothes off, slip into the role of a servant, and now he's putting his kingly, priestly garbs back on, so to speak. But now the disciples looked at him as he reclothed himself, still holding his howl. They saw their king. They saw their king in a new light. And listen to what Jesus says. He says, he resumed his place and said, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher, didaske, this, this, this word that means the person that you set your eyes on, that you receive all of your learning. You are an apprentice to this person. They are your rabbi. You're modeling everything in your life after the teacher. Jesus said, you look to me as your teacher. I am the example to give you, and I am your king. I am your Lord. I'm your master, kurios. It's the same word that was used for a king. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, then you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is a messenger, nor is an apostle greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, that's one thing. Blessed are you if you do them. Jesus says, do you really understand what I've just done to you? Do you really understand this analogy that I have given you? I've just displayed my entire life before you, and now I am asking you to go and do likewise. Make followers of me change the world. Step into darkness, become the light. Be used by me to make pe more people who look like me. And you do it through the servant's identity. This is the tool that I'm giving you. And this wasn't some like grand manipulation that Jesus used. Like I know how to tweak humans and get around their, their, their guards and kind of like get them down to, a, bust them down to where I can like manipulate them to do what I want them to do. This wasn't some grand spiritual manipulation. Remember how this chapter starts off. It says that he loved them till the end. This was rooted and grounded in Jesus' love for them. My love is expressed to you that I want you to become like me. I want you to be transformed into my likeness, but I want that to happen through the loving endearment of me serving you. There's a reason why everyone who met Jesus just melted before him. When Jesus would say some of the most offensive things, some of the, 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 the craziest things, it was completely against everything in the world, but people would hear Jesus and just be like, okay, you got me. I'm in. The reason why people did that is because they were responding to Jesus' sincere and genuine love to them. When Jesus stood before someone, he had, he had this amazing ability just to completely block out the rest of the world, look someone right in their face and say, you are the most important person in the world right now and you have my full attention. I want to love and serve you. And when they experienced that from Jesus, Jesus, anything you have to say, man, I'm in. I'm, I'll, I'll do it. No one has ever loved me the way you are loving me right now. And Jesus is looking at his disciples and, and, and he's saying, not only is the key to your sanctification, the key to you becoming more like me, the key, the crux is holding on to the image of a servant. And not only will that change you and give you a bold clarity in life, it'll take away the insecurity, the immaturity, those rash emotional responses that you have. It'll take care of all of that. Not, not only that, but this is the key to the sanctification of the world. When you can take on the image of a servant and serve the world in genuine love, they will finally receive what you have to say. Does that sound like something our world needs right now? A better, more pure expression of what it means to be a follower of Jesus? Listen to this. It says, this is not 
a subtle shift in mentality. Do I have it up here? Nope. I'll get there. There we go. There we go. Hold it there. I'm going to stop touching this. You guys can help me out. All right. This is a quote from Robert Russell. He works at Emory and Henry University. He says, this is not a subtle shift in mentality. It is a radical internal change that has outward ramifications. When leaders take on this form of life and leadership, they take the posture of servants and create relationships of trust and healing that will bring mutual liberation and transformation. This kenosis, this emptying of yourself first transforms the individual and then brings transformation to those led. This kenosis, which brings healing and liberation is the key to effective leadership. Do you wanna see this world changed? When you look out in this world and you see the debates that are happening right now, do you want people to land on the side of Jesus and to choose his way? Do you want to step into the darkness and actually be the light that is showing people the love of Jesus? When you look around at this world, like even if it's Peter's in your life or Judas is in your life, is there something, please tell me, there's something in you that desires for that person to find Jesus, to find his truth, and to fall in love with Jesus and follow him? Do you want to be used for that? It starts with this emptying. When you empty yourself, when you set your agenda aside, when you take on the mind of Christ, when you grab your towel and begin serving this world, the Judases will begin to take note. The Peters, those pushing against you, telling you that, that, that they're wrong, eventually the love of your service and the genuine nature of your ability to look at them and say, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna disregard everything. I just want you to know that you're important, that I love you. And I wanna serve you. That's when you begin to see lives change. That's what it means to have the character and priorities of the king with a towel. When you can see Jesus put his clothes back on and you see a king standing before you, but the king is not carrying a sword, He's not carrying a scepter. He's not lording his authority. He's not forcing it on anyone. He's a king standing before you holding a towel. And he's saying, I want you to follow in my example. I want to transform your character. I want to transform your priorities. I want you to look like me. I want you to take on the nature of a servant that will set the groundwork for sanctification in your life. Our security and maturity grows in the clarity of his servant identity. We lead with a towel towards others' sanctification. This is the beginning of the conversation. This is the groundwork. But this is challenging. You want to look for an application point that I encourage you when you get home today, go to your bathroom, go to your linen closet and pull out the dirtiest rag that you should have thrown away a month ago. <laughs> pull it out and start taking that towel into your families. Are you having some marital issues right now? Grab a towel. Serve your husband. Serve your wife. Kids, did you forget your Mother's Day card last week? We know you probably did. Can you serve your mom? Can you serve your family? When you go to your work, your place of business, when you go to your school, when you find yourself surrounded by Peters and Judas's people that are not on the same page as you, people that are actually hostile towards you, can you not emotionally immaturely respond? Can you instead grab a towel and say, you know what? I'm going to find a way to serve this person. Do you want to grow into the likeness of your Savior? It starts with having the mind of Christ. Jesus, we come before you right now and 
I would lie if I was saying that I couldn't, if I wasn't struggling to wrap my head around this. Jesus, I love you so much. I respect you so much. But to see you in humility, lay your clothes aside and literally to take on the image of a servant and to hear your voice calling to me and to all of us saying, will you please just grab your towel? Jesus, we want to follow you. We want to magnify you. We want to make you great. We want the world to look at us and see you. So when it comes to our character, when it comes to our priorities, when it comes to our sanctification, can we start with having your mind and taking on the servant nature that you displayed to us? Suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to live one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ oh, be magnified.
I'm Kurt Gehring. I'd like to welcome you today. I'm a longtime member here and also have the pleasure of serving on the missions board here at Cascade. If today was your first time joining us, welcome. We're so glad you watched this service today. We're here every Sunday, and we would love for you to plug into our church family if you're not already plugged in. There's a digital connect card in the description of this video that you can fill out to tell us more about yourself, ask any questions you have about Cascade, and submit prayer requests. Registration is now open for a variety of summer camps and activities for students of all ages. Check out CascadeChurch.org or the Cascade app to learn more and plug those into your family's summer schedules. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being faithful and obedient in your giving of tithes and offerings. You can give online, on the app, in person, or by mailing a check to Cascade's office here in Monroe. Remember to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for being a part of our Cascade family. Have an awesome day, and we'll see you next week.